Kristen. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Can Do Links to Learning here this Tuesday afternoon. Now, if you're watching this on the replay, we just say hello, welcome, glad you're viewing this. You know, Can Do Links to Learning is all about, you know, sharing knowledge, listening to knowledge, being inspired, building our capacity. So this is a great opportunity for you to learn. So we just invite you to open your mind open your heart, open your spirit to whatever story, whatever knowledge is being shared today. We're honored that you are here. Um, our guest speaker, Robin, is joining us from Victoria, BC. I'm always, for whatever reason, I'm so envious of BC weather here in Alberta. We got the cold, but right now it's pretty, it's pretty nice out. I cannot complain. So, we just always like to take a moment, press pause, take that deep breath. Let your body just relax. Sometimes we don't even realize that we carry that tension and that stress. So taking that breath, I really believe is, you know, creator's gift to us that we have our own regulation system. And so that breath helps us just to restore, to relax. Sometimes we just need to let go. Sometimes we've had, you know, a lot of business going on and we don't realize we're carrying that tension. So, you know, connect to your breath. So we take a moment and we acknowledge the goodness of creator. We acknowledge the gift of this day, the gift of this opportunity that we can gather and meet together virtually all across Turtle Island. So we're honored you're here. Um, we give thanks to creator for the gifts, the gifts of land, the gifts of all of our relatives, the plants, the sacred waters, all that surrounds us that we can walk good and well in this world. So hi, hi to creator for this opportunity, this moment, this day, and this gift. All right, so today's webinar, but first things first, there will be an evaluation link that will be sent to you after today's presentation. And we love to hear your voice, your feedback. So that's important for us. But for you, when you fill out that evaluation link, your name will be entered to win a draw. And the draw is done at the very end of the month. So this will be on Wednesday, next Wednesday. Um, and it is for a one $500 Visa gift card. Like who couldn't use that extra cash or that extra credit? So please fill out that evaluation link and then your name will be entered to win that draw and you have a good chance of winning. So we'd love to hear from you. There will be opportunity at the end for any comments, questions, discussions, or even lending your own story to, to, to today's conversation. Um, but in the meantime, if you're anything like me, I can be forgetful. So if you have a question that comes up throughout the presentation, put it in the chat box and we'll be sure to refer to it at the end, okay? All right, so today you are not here to listen to me speak. You are here to listen to this amazing conversation, this ongoing conversation, this dialogue that needs to be continuous. It's about decolonizing HR practices. So Robin Ward, she's joining us from Victoria. She's a certified executive coach, certified cultivating safe spaces facilitator, volunteer counselor, creative artist, activist, and drum roll, a change maker. She has mixed European heritage and is the proud mother of two Indigenous boys. So her life and her family's life is rooted in the Anishinaabe seven sacred teachings, which is respect, courage, wisdom, humility, truth, honesty, and love. I love taking a moment just to reflect on those teachings. So these values guide her daily life and hold her personally and professionally accountable throughout her life. So for 20 years, she has focused her professional development on four fields, psychology, business, coaching, and technology. And when she's not supporting clients or facilitating workshops, like being here, she is a board member and a consultant. Ooh, 
add Anamiki. You can correct me if I'm wrong. And I don't mind being wrong. <laughs> she is an ally and social justice is disruptor to all spaces lacking inclusion and human rights. Her focus is healing, connecting, nurturing, and supporting healthy relationships internally and externally. I just loved reading your bio. What an inspiration. So today's webinar um, is well-being, inclusion, validation, and freedom are the protocols in Elaine's Alex cultivating safe spaces framework. So guided by this indigenous framework and nested systems, she will discuss ways to increase these elements throughout HR practices conti to continue to push the limits of how we can decolonize the work that we do together. So focusing on love-based practices to improve operations, strategy, professional development, engagement, relations, diversity, and inclusion, all amazing, amazing things and so important. So we welcome you. We're honored in your busy life that you said, yes, I'm coming to can do, or I'm going to share my knowledge. So the floor is yours. We are honored that you are here. Oh, thank you so much for that wonderful and very warm introduction. I'm just going to share my slides and um, kick into things because there's a lot to talk about and um, we're going to try to squeeze a lot into one hour. So thank you so much everyone for being here today to talk about decolonizing HR practices. At Anemi Key, HR or human resources we've actually renamed to people operations. So one of the, the reasons that we've done that is because the language that we use and the way in which we talk about our people is really important. And so we wanted to put people first in the decisions that we make. And we didn't want to think about humans in terms of resources, because it's kind of linked to that idea of resource extraction um, in a colonized world. So humans have been seen as resources to be extracted from for profit. And so we like to think of humans as people to be loved and respected. And so I was the director of people operations at Aniniki for four years. And I'm so grateful and proud of um, some of the work that we've done to decolonize what Indigenous technology looks like. And so I don't want to take all of the credit. It was a team effort. We worked together very collaboratively. And I'm proud, especially as a non-Indigenous person, that my role was handed over to an Indigenous person, person a wonderful human um, who I uh, call a very dear friend, who has great values of kindness and love to continue the work of decolonizing as much as possible within these colonial systems in which we work. So I still serve on the board at Inimiki, but I've stepped away from daily operations. And I also wanted to just acknowledge before I get started with humility, because that's one of our values that I'm still learning. And I'll not be able to discuss all of these concepts and ideas fully. And so in order to try and honor the work and the people that have guided me here, I'm going to do my best. But if anything feels tricky or doesn't sit right, please reach out to me at any point in time to advance my learning as a non-Indigenous ally in understanding this work that we're doing together. And so I'll leave my contact information in the chat at the end. Of course, I want to start with a land acknowledgement. So it's always respectful to open with that. I live and work on beautiful Lekwungen speaking people's territory, also known as Victoria, BC. I like to mention that it originally occupied 14 different villages all around what is currently known as Victoria, BC. And want to acknowledge with love, gratitude and respect the traditional keepers of the land who for millennia have passed on their culture and history and traditions from one generation to the next and continue to share their wisdom as uh, as uh, protectors, stewards and custodians of the land today. And I like to participate in land acknowledgements as well to hold myself accountable as an uninvited visitor um, to my personal commitment in terms of history, language and protocol. So I always like to say Ayaskwechel, which is the Lekwungen word for good day um, to kick us off into um, what we'll be talking about today. So the agenda is we're going to talk about introducing cultivating safe spaces. So what is that? How does it work for those who aren't familiar with it? Then we'll talk about how we at Anemi Key have used the framework uh, to improve and decolonize the work that we're doing. 
And lastly, we'll end with some discussion. It's an opportunity to talk a little bit about how we decolonize the work we do. Cultivating Safe Spaces was developed by Elaine Alec. She's an author, political advisor, women's associate, spiritual thought leader, and teacher, and is a direct descendant of hereditary chiefs. And so she's gathered knowledge throughout her time working in community to develop this framework of, of uh, essentially creating safe spaces or decolonizing the work that we do. So she's a leading expert in Indigenous planning, health advocacy, and creating safe spaces. And uh, I received certification for cultivating safe spaces. So I'm excited to talk about that with you today. But again, if you want to dive deeper, um, I can post the link to her work and some of the, the learning that she offers as well. So this is one of my favorite slides. And it's just a direct comparison of what is colonial spaces work look like versus decolonial spaces. So they're typically the opposite of each other. So colonial spaces are based on fear, sickness and death, exclusion, oppression and shame. And I don't think I need to go into much detail in terms of what that is, um, what that's been historically for Indigenous peoples within um, the North American landscape. So to decolonize, of course, those are love-based practices. So what does well-being look like? What does inclusion look like? And what does freedom and validation look like to decolonize the work that we're doing? So this is it. Ta-da! This is the amazing Elaine Alec framework of cultivating safe spaces. It's a process based on nested systems. So that means there isn't a hierarchy. There isn't one piece that's more important than the other. It's it's the idea that you don't have anything without having a responsibility to it. So nothing I share today, for example, belongs to me. It's an accu accumulation of Elaine's knowledge that's gathered over time, and she shares it so open heartedly with people. Her elders have told her that knowledge is no good if you don't share it. And so we think about the responsibility that we have to continue to teach in the work that we do. And it's a holistic system. So it means every decision you make impacts everything else. It's all interconnected. So when you look, for example, at the First Nations Health Authority and where First Nations people took over their own health, their model is based on a nested system like above. So it's individual, family, community, nation, and land. And the state of everything mirrors the state of everything else. It's all interconnected. So we'll start with the four conditions of cultivating safe spaces, which is the center. And then we'll talk about the four protocols, which are the four posts within this image. Understanding self, I love this. This is, you cannot cultivate safe space if you aren't one. So you have to be a safe space to hold a safe space. And that requires a lot of internal accountability and a lot of internal work. So the way in which we show up, it impacts the people around us. So if I'm triggered, if something resurfaces for me, you can feel it in your body, you experience it, you can um, re-feel feelings, the recirculate through feelings. So it's paying attention and noticing any emotions, anything that's rising up in you and committing to recognizing, revisiting and responding to whatever it is that's coming up for you. One of my favorite lessons that Elaine shared with us is that traditionally when youth in her community would go to elders and ask for advice, the elders would say, go to the water. You, you know the answer, just go to the water and wait for the answer. And this is the idea that we only have the answers within ourselves. And so with time and with the beautiful gift of water, the answer, if you wait by it, will come to you. And that's trusting self, right? And understanding self in that piece. Um, so another teaching that I really love is that, um, the quality of your life depends on the quality of the questions that you ask yourself. And I'm going to say that again, because it's so huge. The quality of your life depends on the quality of the questions that you ask yourself. And this is one of the reasons why I love being a certified executive coach, because I ask a lot of questions. Um, but, you know, Elaine encourages uh, us to ask ourselves, who do we belong to and what is on our heart? And who do we belong to is not, you know, who has ownership of us, obviously, but in relationship, who do we hold ourselves accountable to? Who are we working for at the end of the day? Um, who, whose opinions matter most to us? And so, for example, when I'm introducing myself, I will say, um, 
who do I belong to? I belong to mother earth. I belong to creator. I belong to my children. I belong to my partner. I belong to Animiki Thunderbirds and the work that we do. Um, and, and so much more and centering ourselves and who we belong to is so strong in moving forward in the work that we do. So to work from this place of understanding, we have the answers within us and we make space for exploring what's going on inside of us and understanding self. And then the next circle is love-based practice. So Elaine recommends in your work, decolonizing is putting love-based practices back into communities, back onto teams. Love-based practices decolonize the work. So she asked, is the agenda made with love? Is the project you're working on something that you love? How do you celebrate and acknowledge, acknowledge other teammates and love for other teammates and the work that you're doing together? So how do we indigenize, um, decolonize? Um, we're doing this are we doing this essentially from a place of love or a place of fear? And you can kind of ask that through all of the work that you're doing, anything you're doing per personally or professionally, am I doing this from a place of love or fear? Who's at the wheel? And not to say that fear is important. Fear is um, important information. I love that uh, Elizabeth Gilbert says, fear is always invited on the road trip of life, but under no circumstances should be behind the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, right? Like, don't let fear drive. Don't let it drive. It's important. We validate it, right? We acknowledge it, but it's not the driver. Love should be the driver. And um, a little bit of an acknowledgement too for like a love-based practice or a love-based response to understanding self for both the positive and the negatives that happen throughout life, right? So sometimes it's easy to have a not love-based response to understanding self and being hard on yourself. So having a love-based response, what is the most loving response to having challenges, messing up, showing humility, but also a love-based practice to celebrating, acknowledging the work that you're doing. I think there's equal work there in terms of um, normalizing a love-based response to everything in between the good and the bad, right? Um, and the next the next circle is patience. So this is patience for other people's perspectives and how they show up in the space. When we're impatient or annoyed or triggered, things can resurface for us. So we have to work through the understanding of why I'm impatient, why I'm triggered. Um, again, these are all inter, interrelated relationships, right? Of understanding self and having patience with self, but patience with others as well. Um, and so, Patience is also, I love, Brene Brown talks about understanding other people's perspectives. And so it's not imagining what is it like to be in someone else's shoes and, and pretending essentially or, or trying to figure out. It's asking what it's like to be in their shoes, asking those questions, and then just believing them when they tell you. And so, and then the next circle is discipline. So this is, you know, the idea that it can be hard, it can be <laughs> challenging to understand self. This is a daily practice, right? It can be challenging to have a love-based approach to everything. It can be challenging to show patience, to listen to, for example, opinions that don't necessarily um, fit with your own opinions and, and understand that there are just different perspectives in the world, right? And so having a disciplined approach to listening, for example, you know, the whole concept of like, we have one mouth, but two ears, <laughs> so it's listening to other people's perspective. And that doesn't mean that's your perspective, just because you're listening to them and respecting their perception, their experience. Um, but it is showing respect to them as an individual who's felt that experience. So the bigger piece that we'll be able to dive into today is the four protocols for cultivating safe spaces. So this is what we've outlined as being promoting well-being, promoting inclusion, promoting freedom, and promoting validation. So promoting well-being is the opposite of well-being is sickness and death, right? So promoting well-being for mind, body, spirit. Um, I love a great example is um, how Michelle opened the day, you know, really giving us a moment to take a deep breath you know, promoting well-being throughout the work that we do and creating great space for, for learning and engaging with one another. Um, 
So we live in a society that sports overworking. So for example, addiction to work is totally fine. It's a completely acceptable form of addiction. Um, and so promoting well-being is asking myself, what can I do to um, show my team that they're supported? What can I do to support their well-being physically, emotionally, mentally? For example, incorporating breaks, acknowledging world of events and how they might affect you today. And thinking about the type of supports that might be needed for the team based on what's going on in the world, like a global pandemic, for example. <laughs> um, the next one is promoting inclusion in the, the post there. And so the opposite of inclusion is oppression, right? So, or, um, sorry, I'm gonna go back. The opposite of inclusion is exclusion. That's right. So how do we invite people into spaces? How do we promote well-being? Um, so going beyond, for example, BIPOC, and Two-Spirit LGBTQQIA+, how do we also promote diversity and perspectives in the work that we do? Promoting inclusion of different um, identities, different genders, all of those pieces, and inviting people into the conversation. So as we gather, uh, this is a practice of taking care of one another as a group um, and practicing self-care and building on community and trust is understanding that responsibility doesn't fall on one person, but the community or group as a whole. I also like, and I'm just gonna insert this here even though I wasn't planning to, um, is that uh, Elaine Alec talks a little bit about self-care as being human care. And she's like, when did it become that you have to earn self-care? You know, you don't need to earn sleep. You don't need to earn a meal. You, you know, that is human care. It's, it's not a luxury that you need to work for. I love that. Um, so inclusion is also, you know, everyone at the meeting is given an opportunity to speak and share their perspectives. We don't interrupt a person who's speaking um, and do your best to stay at, attentive to what's being shared in the circle. You know, sometimes people can be in a room, but they're not present. So part of inclusion is being present and that discipline and that patience to remain present as you're engaging in the work that you're doing. Also promoting freedom and freedom of choice. So the opposite of freedom is oppression. So this is, you know, there's been a whole history of choice being taken away from minorities and, and people who have been oppressed over time. So we try to give options as much as humanly possible. So people may be uncomfortable with protocols, sitting for long periods of time, um, the structures of things. So, you know, including many different health and dietary reasons. So just always promoting freedom as much as possible. A great example is, you know, we're on a webinar right now. Some people may want to be on video. Some people may not want to be on video when they ask questions and that is okay. So you have freedom of choice in how you want to engage. And we're just grateful that you're here, you know? Um, and it acknowledges that in order to have space that is safe, people need to know they have choice. These protocols are put in place to help people make decisions and build trust and respect. They're not meant for people to be uncomfortable you know, or feel shame around not being able to participate in the way that everyone else is participating. So these are all hard to practice day to day, um, you know, and I think also systems like, sorry, I did not silence my phone, that's terrible. <laughs> um, so um, we have learned from systems like, <laughs> um, systems like school systems that have been put into place that have internalized oppression, right? So it's a lot of unlearning. Um, as a leader, it's easy to, for example, pick teams that are similar to me, that have my same story, that work in the same way that I do. But if we only pick people that look like us, talk like us, sound like us, and work like us, um, then we're leaving a lot of perspective, a lot of wisdom out of the work that we're doing. Um, and so you can tell it's a colonized process when it is the least amount of time, the least amount of money, and the least amount of people. It's decolonized when you take time to be together, to connect and have relationships, when there are many people and many different perspectives involved. Um, and it takes up more resources, which can be uncomfortable for some, but I can say from the work that I've done at Anemi Key that having different perspectives, different knowledge, different feedback really advances the work that we're doing. It always makes it better at the end, you know, to take that extra time. 
So supporting freedom is practicing active listening and witnessing. This can be, like I said, the most challenging protocol to listen. And especially I've been in spaces where I very much disagree, for example, with what's being, what's being said. Um, and yet taking the time to have those conversations or taking the time to just listen and be like, okay, so this, from this perspective, like the whole point of colonization was for all of us to be colonized. So if someone is coming at it from a colonized perspective, you know, colonization is still well at work and there's still lots of work to do to decolonize that space. Um, and it's not going to happen overnight. Unfortunately, it's going to take a lot of work. And Elaine Alec would say it's an individual level, like indigenous people, they know the answers, they are fine. A lot of the decolonizing work that needs to happen is outside of that circle, right? <laughs> Mainstream that people are buying into and it's not serving anyone. We have highest suicide rates, highest addiction, obesity, mental health crisis, all kinds of things that are going on for humanity that doesn't work within these colonized systems for people and their health. Um, and so validation, it asks you to stay open-minded without judging a person's perspective and experience as right or wrong includes putting your phone away or perhaps turning it off when you're doing a webinar. Um, uh, Brene Brown shared a really great, another um, learning as well, which is that it can be unreliable to have that rule of treat someone how you wanna be treated because it may not align with what that person wants or how they wanna be treated. So pronouns is a great example of this. I personally have never changed my pronouns or my name. So I may not understand how to address someone with, for example, gender fluidity. So one way that I show up to that space is I, I typically have in my Zoom, my pronouns, she, her, inviting people to identify in that way um, and validate their experience, even though I may not know or understand what their experience is like. Um, every little piece that you work on of all of these pieces of this nested system uh, levels you up in other areas. So the more you understand self, the better you are at inclusion, the more you have a love-based practice, the more you can promote well-being. They're all interconnected in that way. HR policies typically promote sickness and death. And so they're put into place to promote an organization's profitability and essentially the heads of the organization to protect the money and the top people within the organization. So there's also, you probably noticed there's four different perspectives as well in this slide. There's the traditional perspective, relationship, action, and innovative perspective. I don't think I have time to go into that today, but I highly recommend, and I will put a link to Elaine's um, work and some videos that she has if you're interested in learning about those perspectives. And essentially that's how people have different voices in the work that they show up. Um, so uh, maybe just a little taste of it is like promoting a traditional perspective would be someone who's a very big storyteller, takes a lot of time, re resource um, references, history. Um, relationship is all about connection and they show up to the work. Action perspective is like, let's get it done. Let's make a list. Let's get make sure when the deadline is. And innovative typically needs time to work with the material. Um, days usually, if not weeks, to kind of figure it out, pull it apart and figure out how to put it back together in a better way. And so sometimes in meetings, you can see how these different perspectives are necessary and really advance each other within the meeting to have that different diversity and inclusion. Special mention for the, this model actually came from a nested system based on the story of the four food, four food chiefs. And I will put a link in the chat about that. Sorry, I'm just looking at at the end, maybe. Or should I do it now? Um, it's a great video to watch and talks a little bit about the way in which this nested system came from traditional indigenous knowledge. Um, again, we could talk about these kinds of things for days, but I'm going to move on to the next section, which is talking about how Inimi Key has um, use this framework um, essentially in the work that we do to increase well being, for example. So, we'll start with well being. So, well being is just being comfortable, being safe, feeling healthy, and being happy. So, one of the first things that we did to decolonize our work and to create well being within Anemiki is we adopted indigenous values. 
So our CEO and founder, Jeff Ward, is Anishinaabe, and in 2017, we decided to adopt the seven sacred teachings or the grandfather, the seven grandfather teachings as an organization. We had a retreat with our entire team, and we had everyone had the opportunity to essentially define these values according to us. And then we asked our team um, questions like, what does love look like at work? What does courage look like? What does respect look like? What does honesty look like? And we define them and put them on our website. And so um, I will also put a link to that um, if you want to check that out. And these values are interwoven in everything we do. So starting with the hiring process and the questions that we ask potential team members to uh, how we work together, the work we choose to do, how we celebrate each other's work, how we honor our partners and the work that we do. It's embedded in the language that we use to guide every step of our operations and impact by Mimiki. And here are some examples of that which I'm very excited to talk about today. So well-being. At Anemi Key, we have two kinds of health benefits. So one is that we have the standard health benefit covers life insurance, dental prescriptions, paramedical like massage, chiropractor. We also have a flex policy. So this is where our, our well-being really shines. So there's a thousand dollars that each team member gets to buy an Apple watch, Lululemon workout gear, nice running shoes, traditional medicine, bikes for kids so that you can go for family bike rides together. Um, it promotes healthy living to have a little extra for exercise equipment, workout gear, climbing gear, a paddle board, um, and really promoting health and wellness. Also, we have time away. So we have a standard vacation time, which is 15 days and personal leave is 10 days. And we rename them to personal days. We don't call them sick days because we don't want our team to feel like they need to be sick to take time. Sometimes you just need a day off. Sometimes you just need to refresh, recharge, um, cuddle kids, walk dogs, whatever it is that kind of fills your cup and, and makes you feel healthy and well. We've extended as well our bereavement leave to include five days to grieve the loss of a chosen family member. So this is quite different. So this can include family members, cousin, a favorite auntie or uncle that you've adopted, um, including the loss of a pregnancy or, um, and that's for someone who is a birthing or non-birthing parent. So this is our way of kind of recognizing that family looks different, family feels different. It doesn't necessarily always mean blood and, um, you know, I, you can be absolutely crushed by uh, you know, someone who was like a cousin to you passing in the same way that so someone who's a blood relative a cousin is, might pass. Um, we also have two days for non-chosen family members, including you know, best friends um, or family of best friends. So whoever you declare that sort of non-family um, member to be. We also have cultural leave available for hunting and ceremony practices. This year, we introduced uh, seven community love days, which are days that are added to a typical long weekend. So our team gets a four day long weekend where they would normally have a three day long weekend. And we shut down all of our operations because what we noticed is that sometimes when people go away on vacation, they don't always unplug their email. And so sometimes they're like supposed to be up on that. <laughs> they're supposed to be off that day and they'll be like sucked back in. And so if we shut down operations, we know that everyone is working on their wellness that day. We also have something called flex time. So this is the idea that you can shift your schedule around throughout the day. So if, for example, your day changes as it does, you can expect the unexpected. Um, kids get sick, a pipe might burst in your home, a delivery might take longer than you expected. If you need to shift your schedule throughout the day, that's totally fine. And so we ex sort of expect the unexpected. Retreats, we have quarterly retreat gatherings, typically virtual since COVID, but we're hoping to go back to in-person ones after um, or very soon. So during these retreats, we have team building activities. We've, um, we've done all kinds of things to essentially the primary reason for retreats is getting together. It's relationship-based. How do we build relationships? How do we nurture each other, especially through a global pandemic? How do we create connectedness through technology? And so we'll host talking circles. We'll have fun check-in questions. Um, we'll play escape room games. Uh, we've cooked with Mr. Bannock. We've completed art activities like drum making and painting paddles and doing beading. 
we've done all kinds of activities together. We've even done axe throwing, which is a weird thing to admit, but we did and it was very fun. <laughs> There's a lot of laughter. Um, we learn together during retreats, so including the Cultivating Safe Spaces framework and traditional medicines, having elder time, medicine wheel teachings, all kinds of things like that. We have gifts during our retreat and we select gifts based on the medicine wheel. So we always have at least one thing that promotes mental health, emotional health, physical health and spiritual or cultural health. And usually within that as well, we do strive to um, embrace different forms of ind indigeneity, different um, representation of indigeneity. So, you know, we may have like Inuit tea and, um, you know, an Anishinaabe uh, smudge kit and those kinds of things. So trying to create diversity within Indigenous identity as well. Um, we've given tea, coffee, bannock mixes, soup mixes, chocolate, smoked salmon, maple syrup, beaded pins, books, blankets. Cool and any key swag like t shirts, socks, and hats, portable chargers, moccasins from Manitoba mucklucks, puzzles, medicines, smudge kits, all of those kinds of things. And we typically smudge the gifts before they go out. And we also have team recognitions. So we use a software program called Bonusly, and we use that to give each other recognitions within the team according to our values. So, for example, someone might say, um, love, hashtag love and hashtag respect to the team for working together to complete project A, which is great because it really amplifies our, our values and our team at the same time and really recognizes each other. We have had annual fundies, which is where the team celebrates one another and according to the values will print an image of an animal. I have two of them behind me right here. I have a loved one and a humility one. Um, and we print it out, give it to the team member, and also those words of love and respect and acknowledgement based on our values to each individual team member. We have a quarterly drum recognition where we have a beautiful drum that is um, a thunderbird, and it changes ownership based on the team will recommend or recognize someone who they feel has done really outstanding work in the last quarter. And it's this beautiful, ceremony and recognition for the team member to really hold them up in the work that they're doing. We also have this philosophy when we have, we share. And so we give out bonuses to our team based on the success of the company, usually around the holiday season. Um, we also have safety. So each new team member is assigned a buddy or team coach to support them in their onboarding. Elder Jerry Ullman from the podcast Teaching in the Air advises us to have health buddies. So for those people that are interested, we put them into a random match. You know, whoever's interested mentions, yes, I would like a health buddy this month. And so we randomly generate and match people up based on who wants to participate. And they just have a reason to connect and have a cup of coffee and check in on one another. Um, and Elder Jerry has also offered our team support as well, um, the elder support. Um, every team member at Animiki is required to take the PHSA Indigenous Cultural Safety Training to ensure cultural safety for our team and our partners in the work that we do. As well as recently, our team's taken psychological safety and some BIPOC training to talk about other marginalized peoples and the intersectionality of those oppressed in our current systems to disrupt, dismantle, and demolish systems of oppression. So at this time, I want to invite some participation. So I have this thing called Menti Setup, where if you go to this website and you put in this number, you can, oh, so you can do it this way or you can put it in the chat, whichever you feel more comfortable with because freedom and inclusion. Um, but essentially, you know, what's one way you think you can increase well-being on your team? And that can be something that's personal. So some way that you can show up, have a potluck, go for a walk with someone, have a walking meeting. Um, I have a, the, the wonderful Charles Frank, who took over my role as director of people operations, sometimes drops off ice cream for me. And I just, oh, it warms my heart so much. So, <laughs> so it can be well-being on a personal level or on a company level. So where do you think perhaps any of these practices or practices that you've thought of as well could incre increase 
well-being within your um, your teams. I'm gonna leave it open. I think I'll go over here now. Should work to put in some answers. I might have to put something in here just in case. Um, increase well being, uh, monthly massage, for example. And sorry, I'll do managing windows here. I'm not sure how to show the results. <laughs> this is my first time. Oh, here we go. Okay, I'm gonna pull this over here and there we go. Awesome. So increasing well-being, elder support, check-ins, circle check-in, love it, provide holistic supports when experiencing vicarious trauma. Yes, Elaine Alex says, vicarious trauma, expecting the work that we do on a daily basis, even at an Amy Key that touches trauma in such a meaningful way and it not affecting you is like, walking through water and expecting not to get wet, which I am like, yes, yes, that's exactly what that means. Oh, beautiful. Yay. Thank you so much. Time off. Absolutely. Um, know each other, share stories, totally quarterly lunches. I love it. Yay. You have such great ideas of well-being, everyone. Oh, that's awesome. That's so great. Ensure proper staffing levels. Absolutely. That's awesome. Good job, everyone. And thank you for <laughs> taking the adventure and in, into Menti with me. Okay, so next we're going to talk about, um, and I have to restart apparently. Um, I believe the next one is inclusion. So inclusion is the action or state of including or being included within a group or structure. So my favorite example of a inclusion is sitting in circle. I love sitting in circle. Circle is magic. <laughs> and everyone sits at the same level. Everyone is invited to speak. Everyone's voice matters. Everyone's story matters. Everyone's experience matters. And this is one of my favorite ways that we share our gifts with one another. Another example of inclusion that I love is Halloween. Kids come to the door for candy and we give candy no matter their age, their gender, their ability, their religion. So one of my favorite holidays for that very reason that it's generosity without limits or filters uh, to strangers or neighbors, everyone gets candy. I absolutely love it. Um, and this obviously increases as well the, the sense of belonging on the team like Brene Brown talks about. It's small acts of we, we build a sense of belonging and a sense of trust with small acts over time. So it's not, um, you don't go from zero to 60 <laughs> in one act of kindness or one act of, of building trust. It's over time. It's remembering birthdays. It's remembering the names of loved ones and, and those kinds of things over time. And I think also thinking a little bit about intersectionality and, and having some knowledge around intersectionality and how that might affect someone feeling included or not included. I'll give you a great example. It was sort of sad, but I went to a amusement park recently where my son got kicked off of one of the rides because he was too tall. It was so terrible. <laughs> so we definitely had to overcompensate, but like that sense of like not thinking that body size matters, but it really does, right? It really does affect um, what, what people might be included in and not included in. Um, so inclusion, what we've done at Anini Key. We have within our hiring, recruiting and onboarding an invitation for indigenous people, people of color, um, people with disabilities, members of the 2S LGBTQQIA plus community to strongly encourage to apply. And we have equal benefits and time away is offered for all of our hires. So we try to treat everyone essentially equally as they come into our team. We have pay equity policies, so pay bans. So you can know in, within your role what that sort of pay structure looks like and even leveling up within that sort of career path, what that will look like. We have a pay equity committee to make sure that we are paying women equally to men. Um, we have 
an internally published compensation philosophy as well. In terms of virtual space, we think about team building and virtual so socialization that's built on the way that we work. So one example is when we meet for retreats and it is a virtual space, whether people are as far away as, you know, the East Coast to the West Coast, or if they're in the same room together, everyone is sitting in front of a screen and participating with their face um, matching the screen so that everyone feels included and equal in, in how we're engaging with each other. We have a broad-based stock option plan, which means everyone at Inimiki receives stock options. And we have a board diversity policy, which means uh, our board is 50% women or non-binary and 50% Indigenous. And we do check-in questions. And I love this. So this is whether we're in circle or we're just checking in with one another, you know, the, that piece of who do you belong to and what's on your heart that's recommended by Elaine Alec. Or we sometimes have some fun check-in questions like, What's your favorite place you've ever traveled? If life had cheat codes, what cheat codes would you use? Not needing sleep or food was definitely one mentioned. <laughs> and um, what's something that's made you your heart happy this week, for example? So having some check-in questions of how people are, are doing. So now we're gonna try the Menti again. What's one way you can increase inclusion on your team? And I'm going to move to, okay, so I pulled it over here. Um, I think if I now go to the next slide. Should update here so that you can add. No, nope, it's still well being. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not sure why it's not updating, but thinking about inclusion, right? So, how do you in increase inclusion? Um, and you know what? Again, this, and maybe we put it in the chat because I can't seem to get the Mentimeter working. So, I, my apologies for that. But um, how do we include, include ourselves within Circle? How do we include how we're feeling, our emotions? Um, how are we inclusive towards ourselves? And then how are we inclusive towards others? And then how are we inclusive within our organization, right? So thinking a little bit about how do we create these inclusive spaces? I'm sorry, that's, that didn't work. I'm checking to see if anyone mentioned in the chat. I'm just gonna keep going on because otherwise um, <laughs> um, we are running out of time and I wanna talk about all of the pieces. So we've talked about well-being, we've talked about inclus inclusion. Oops. Sorry, let me get back to my notes. Validation. Okay, there we go. Validation means that we're acknowledging another person's emotions, thoughts, experience, values, and beliefs. So like Elaine said, you just ask people what their story is, ask them what their thoughts are. And when they tell you, you just believe them. At Anemiki, some of the validating practices that we have is we have an annual employee survey, surveys where we have anonymous participation to encourage unfiltered truth telling. And a lot of the time, the feedback that we've collected through this over the years has led to how we change our policy and operations over time. So for example, the pet policy and having um, the ability to take time away, whether you have a new pet or you have a pet that's, that's passed, we now have um, essentially a, a welcome a new pet or a grieving a pet policy. Self-directed learning and development. We have five days or $1,000 a year to advance your learning and growth. So this is to identify education, learning, training, development goals annually that will benefit both you and the company essentially within your role. So of course you couldn't like um, take a pizza making <laughs> course. So it has to be kind of within your role, but you know, a really great opportunity for courses, workshops, conferences, self-study, books, webinars, all of those kinds of things to really advance your learning and the work that you're doing and feeling um, validated in what you're interested in within your career path. We also have volunteer opportunities. So we offer one day a year for our team members to volunteer on behalf of 
any new key, and this is paid time to volunteer within the community, um, selecting organizations that they support. Um, I typically have volunteered for the Moosehide campaign, for example. So there's a provincial event at the Moosehide campaign. It's been such an honor to just sit and be in those spaces, but it is one of the days that I've really appreciated uh, getting from Animiki in the work that I've done. Innovation. So of course, we're technology, right? We, we need to support a, a space of innovation and choose something, uh, give our team the opportunity to choose something to be innovative about um, within their um, interests. And so an example of an innovation project is we had for a little while an Indigenous Innovators podcast, which I deeply hope that will come back into play because it was so great to basically recognize and honor Indigenous innovators. And there's also the Indigenous Innovators quotes that were going out for some time. And that, those were both innovation projects. As well, there's a retreat planning circle. So having different perspectives, different ideas around how do we gather what kind of gifts do we give each other? You know, how do we spend meaningful time together? It's so important that we have different perspectives in that. And so, you know, I, for example, the, you know, the, some folks are real foodies. So of course they influenced and encouraged some food making and sharing, which was really wonderful. Um, others might be more interested in painting. And so that resulted in doing some painting on the paddle boards, which is really great. So again, an invitation, and I don't have the mentee set up for this, but an invitation to put in the chat, you know, what is a way in which you think validation can be increased on your team? Yeah. And I love this. So for inclusive, we have um, inclusive of self, knowing the best schedule, inclusive of others, let them know why and what works best for me. Um, yeah, I'm so curious what other people do as well to represent these, these, um, things and we will have, oh, we're running out of time. I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, uh, I'll go on to the next one. I'm going to put up my contact information. So if you want to chat about this stuff ever, I love, love talking about this. So reach out to me. Don't hesitate. And we'll get some time to get together. I'll go through freedom really quickly. So freedom um, is understood as either having the ability to act or change without constraint or to possess the power and the resources to fulfill one's purpose unhithered. Freedom is choice, choice as much as possible. And so at any me key, freedom of choice is those flex hours that I was mentioning, how you know we expect the unexpected, you might need to do elder care, child care for chosen family. Um, team members can work five days a week or four days a week, depending on if they want to have a longer weekend. We also have an external work policy for people that have other side hustles going on. We have several people who are, um, you know, you know, amazing videographers or social media people. And to just make it very clear that we want to, um, we want to and understand that other people may have other opportunities elsewhere choice uh we encourage choice as much as possible so sometimes we'll have we communicate within slack and so we'll have for example polls of when we're meeting for lunch you know where do you want to meet for lunch and people will vote and that kind of thing or what do you want to have for the retreat meal those kinds of things so that we really get as much feedback from the team as possible as well as we're planning how do we get together and what would speak most to people's hearts and also in our giving back initiatives so our team helps select the scholarship recipients, for example. So I know that's something our team is working on right now is reviewing the applications for our scholarships and deciding who's going to be getting them. Statutory holidays as well. We have a statutory holiday substitution form. So this is such a wonderful way of diversity, inclusion, and freedom all wrapped into one. It's the ability to choose different holidays based on your gender, religion, anything you want. It doesn't have to... Um, be the standard mainstream statutory holidays. You can choose to, for example, switch out uh, Victoria Day for Pride Week or Ramadan or anything in between. And so giving people the flexibility to say, you know, we this is paid time off, but you can move it around if you want to. A lot of people don't use that because of course we're within a colonial system where our kids are off on certain days and those kinds of things. So, but it is nice to have the freedom and people do use it. 
uh, within an Emiki to shift around their days and take off, for example, winter solstice is coming up December 21st. So we have a few people taking that off instead of um, another day. We also have a sabbatical. So one month every five years where people can just have paid time off to celebrate the amazing work they've done over five whole years of commitment and work at an Emiki. And so thinking about what's one way to increase freedom on your team and <laughs> what would that look like? And I'm so sorry, we're, we were very limited for time, but really wanting you to encourage you to think about this because I've shared what Anemi Key's vision has been, what Anemi Key's, um, based on our team, based on our team's experience, perspective and feedback, what we've kind of put together for decolonizing the work that we do. And I'm sure your communities look different. Um, and would have very different ideas. So also an invitation to think about how we decolonize the work short-term, medium-term and long-term, right? So, you know, what can we do today to decolonize the work versus maybe this year, maybe the next 10 years um, to create more, essentially more loving spaces. And that's it. So not a lot of time for questions, three minutes, but please <laughs> let me know if you have any questions. I'm just going to stop the share and share my contact information and a couple extra links. That was a beautiful presentation. And I do not use that word lightly, especially in an economic development, you know, webinar, but that was beautiful. Um, and so inspiring and so practical as well. Okay, enough talking. We only have two minutes, three minutes for anyone to have come on in and ask a question. The floor is open, now is your time. You will also get this presentation. Um, Elsie will be sending this out to you after, after today. So you will have this to look over. And you also, this is recorded. So this will go onto CanDo website. So if you feel like, wow, um, you know, somebody, my colleagues, my boss really need to hear this presentation, you can access this video on Candu's websites. So one question um, is how, how organizations with smaller budgets, nonprofits can prioritize employees, but just may not have the resources to do so. And that is an excellent question. Yeah, that is a really excellent question. I mean, so I will I will humbly admit that Animiki did not start off with health benefits. We just didn't have it within our budget. And I think um, one piece that I didn't get to talk about is the difference between striving for perfection versus excellence. So perfectionism can get you trapped in a endless spiral of despair, <laughs> um, whereas striving for excellence is just a different space. So it's that, that thinking about decolonizing in the one year, two year, 10 year space and then what's possible. So, I mean, you have to work within a budget obviously, but I would, I would say if there's a limited budget, it might be a great opportunity to uh, survey, especially a small team and say, well, what are the things that mean most to you? If we only have budget to increase health benefits, have more time off or have a retreat, what would mean most to the team? And then making decisions about, uh, based on that feedback, what would be most meaningful to the team? What are examples of community love days? Uh, so community love days is we shut down the all of Animiki operations. So our last community love day, I believe was last Monday. So it was tacked onto the Remembrance Day long weekend. And it's the way that we show love to our team. And so, you know, it's, it's a little bit based in, there aren't many days where the whole world just takes a minute, takes a beat <laughs> to be with family. You know, even a lot of people like work through family days or, or through the holidays and those kinds of things. So we saw that and we really wanted to, and especially throughout a pandemic where burnout is high um, and, and those kinds of things are, are really impacting how people are able to work and how they're able to show up. We just wanted to give people more time to recharge. I think a lot of the time we're like that pot, um, sorry, we're like that, um, the frog in the pot where you're like slowly turning up the temperature and they just acclimate to like higher levels of stress, higher levels of demand, higher levels of all these things. And so it was our way to kind of turn the heat down a little bit <laughs> um, because um, I think we're still 
at the very beginning of understanding what this pandemic has done for our communities. And then there's all the other pieces of, in the work we do, right? The intergenerational trauma and all of the, the things and the intersectionality of hardships that have been done there. And like, we have just barely scratched the surface of um, the strain and the stress that people are on and understanding it. Gabor Mate has a new book called The Myth of Normal. I highly, highly recommend this book. It's essentially like we, as a society live within a broken system that is making everyone sick and killing a lot of people. And his recommendation actually, you know, spoiler alert, <laughs> lock your ears if you don't wanna hear, um, but it's basically if we had a trauma-informed education system, a trauma-informed um, justice system and a trauma-informed health healthcare system, we would be a better society for it. And so just understanding that this whole myth of there are traumatized people and non-traumatized people is, is false. We all carry, he calls it big T trauma. So that's like abuse, you know, neglect, um, car accident, anything that's, you know, big trauma. And then little T trauma, which doesn't mean that it's not a big deal, but it means it's not talked about as much. And that's, you know, missed opportunity for connection. If somebody shares a feeling with you and says, oh, I'm, this is really weighing heavy on me. And they're like, oh, you don't have time for feelings. You need to get back to work, you know, or you don't have time for feelings. You have things to do. And, and something that he talks about too, that speaks close to me in my heart is that women are the shock absorbers when, when society's under stress. We are the ones that carry the extra weight around um, keeping families healthy, happy, well, Typically, if there are extra stressors within the society, we're the shock absorbers. And um, I don't know about any other females here, but I definitely feel that. And I have an amazing partner. I have like the best partner in the world. Um, and yet I feel as though, yeah, women have different roles sometimes within our society, different expectations. So, yeah. Ooh, you just brought a lot, even just in that, you know, two minutes. Um, <laughs> You brought so much. There's one last question that if you could, you know, spend under 30 seconds responding to. That. I mean, I think yeah. it's a pretty simple yeah. um, question. Things like bereavement leave, professional development, volunteer days, community love days, pet leave. These are all paid for. Is this a shared expense with the employees? No. So many more questions. Connect with me anytime. I did put my so a website and a way to kind of click and and um, and email me or book time with me. So. Uh, Professional development is paid, bereavement is paid depending on if it's a family or non-family member and depending on how much time you need. So we have um, five days for chosen family and two days for non-chosen family. If anything doesn't fall within that category, I don't think it would be paid. Um, volunteer days are paid, community love days are paid, pet leave is paid. Yes, yeah, we wanna make sure that people <laughs> feel like, um, they can step away for this. I am so inspired by the fact that a lot of Indigenous communities absolutely shut down operations when they are grieving the loss of someone, that there is an acknowledgement for the emotion around losing someone and saying goodbye to them. And it is a natural part of life and we need to make space for it and make time for it. It takes a lot to process um, losing someone that you love. I, I love, um, there was a quote I heard once, probably lots of people here have heard it as well, but every time an elder dies, it's like a library burnt down. You lose so much information, you lose so much opportunity for learning. And so, yeah, um, connect with me anytime, Kim, for more questions. <laughs> I love you and I love your work and you know that, but I'm telling you anyway, <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Robin. You just brought so much. I feel like this was my love language listening to you and, and especially that piece about self-care is human care. Uh, there were so many things actually I wrote down. Thank you for the knowledge um, that you shared in such a loving and good way. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, I can just tell, I can just hear, I can just um, feel those seven sacred teachings that are just, you know, lived through you. So thank you for the work you do. And thank you all for being here. I hope you walk away. Oh, so inspired and with good knowledge and that you're thinking about your own organizations and your own nations. And how do we do this in the, this such good way. So thank you for being with us. We hope that we see you again soon. Be well, take those moments of self-love, self, -love, self
self-care. Uh, you, We have the rest of the day, the sun's still out. So you have opportunity to just take a moment for yourself and to find that connection. So thank you all, be well, and we'll see you again soon. Peace, everyone.